Welcome everyone, I'm Emily Humphreys, an orthopaedic doctor at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and today I will guide you through a standard foot and ankle history and examination appropriate for elective or trauma patients. You may wish to pause, skip forward and or go back as necessary. To start your orthopaedic assessment, you should perform hand hygiene, introduce yourself, identify the patient, explain the history and exam process, gain consent and ensure appropriate exposure and positioning. Attention to the patient should start as they walk into the room. With particular attention to the patient's face for signs of pain or apprehension, gait, walking aids, and comparison to their other limb. With regards to gait, check for antalgic gait, walking for less time in the stance phase than the other side, as well as the presence of foot drop, which is demonstrated by the inability to lift the ankle. This patient may compensate by lifting their knee high. Take a targeted history. Importantly, ascertain the mechanism of injury or the symptoms in the patient's own words. In a trauma scenario, the mechanism of injury may allow you to identify the most likely pathology. The mechanism for a trauma presentation may include a twisting type injury, and often the patient doesn't remember the exact direction. However, different twisting directions can result in different injuries. An inversion injury may affect the anterior talofibular ligament, the calcaneofibular ligament or result in a fifth metatarsal base fracture. This is the most common mechanism, but may be a combination of inversion and eversion. An eversion injury affects the deltoid ligament or results in a syndesmosis injury. Hyperdorsiflexion may result in a talus fracture or a dislocated perineal tendon. Hyperplantarflexion may result in a talus fracture. Take a pain history. We suggest using the Socrates acronym. Sight. Where is the pain, or the maximal site of the pain? Onset. When did the pain start, and was it sudden or gradual? Include also whether it is progressive or regressive. Character. What is the pain like? Is it an ache, or stabbing, or burning? Radiation. Does the pain radiate anywhere? Associations. Are there any signs or symptoms associated with the pain? Time course. Does the pain follow any pattern? Exacerbating or relieving factors. Does anything change the pain? Severity. How bad is the pain? Then move to a functional history. Inquire about any limp, walking distance, inability to run or negotiate stairs, and impacts on activities of daily living. Ask about stiffness. Is it in the morning or night? Is it bilateral in location? and screen for other joint involvement. Swelling, ask about length of time, progression. Is it painful? Is it local or generalized? Is it associated with any injury? The sensation of locking may suggest a loose body or an osteochondral defect. Giving way may also be a symptom and may be secondary to pain or chronic anterior talofibular ligament rupture. If there is any history of instability in the affected ankle, you may assess for signs of hypermobility using Baton score. Furthermore, screen for any red flags, including weight loss, neurovascular changes, night pain, fevers or night sweats, swelling in young patients or erythema. Regarding previous investigations or interventions, remember also to ask what they have tried before. You may lose some rapport with the patient if your management plan includes a treatment that they feel they have previously tried and failed. Be vigilant that foot and ankle pain can be referred from lumbosacral pathology and a screening history and examination should be conducted. It is also important to take a brief medical history with particular emphasis on diabetes, venothromboembolic events, neurological problems, vascular conditions including a CVA, and prior ulcers and varicose veins. If surgery is going to be considered, important to take a full medical history and highlight any risks of surgery and any areas which may need to be optimised prior to surgical intervention. Additionally, a social history is important as part of rehabilitation and discharge planning options. For example, a patient with stairs at home may require alternative arrangements, and if this is not recognised preoperatively, it may delay their discharge planning. Another important aspect of the social history is to ask about smoking. It is also necessary to ascertain their pre-operative level of function. The 75-year-old retiree will be treated differently to the 25-year-old labourer who enjoys football. 
Moving on to the look part of the examination. Ensure adequate exposure of the required joint, in this case groin to toes, however, shorts are worn here to maintain actor modesty. Ask if there is any pain before commencing and if so, point with one finger. Modify your exam accordingly by touching this area last if possible. Please remember that you will lose rapport with the patient and your examiner if you cause pain. Therefore, please modify your examination depending on the location of the patient's pain and examine this area last always looking at the patient's face so you can recognise apprehension and pain early and stop. This is particularly important in trauma patients but can equally affect chronic conditions. The general principles of an orthopaedic examination follow the structure of look, feel, move, test. Some special tests will, for efficiency's sake, be performed earlier than the special test section. Remember that not all tests are needed on every patient and you should consider different tests depending on what you have found out in the history. For example, there's no point performing a Simmons-Thompson test in a patient with an ankle sprain. While they are exposing the area, this is often a good opportunity to examine the patient's shoe, looking for wear patterns and insoles. Assess both legs, foot and ankle from the front, side and back, initially in the standing position, asking your patient to turn sequentially. Assess anteriorly looking for scars, skin changes, symmetry, hallux valgus or other toe deformities, calluses or swelling of the ankle. In this example, you can see a partial nail resection and hammer toe. Looking medially, first assess the arch of the foot ensuring the patient is putting weight through the foot. A normal arch would accommodate two fingers. If not, it would indicate pes planus as with both patient's left feet here. Now contrast the respective patient's right feet here as shown. With left hand side example, pes planus, but with right hand side patient with normal foot arch. Finally, assess laterally, including once again any deformities such as hammer toe as seen on the right hand side of the screen and assess function by asking the patient to raise onto tiptoes and then heels. Assess posteriorly, including the gastrocnemius muscle bulk, skin changes over the Achilles tendon, and overall alignment. Notice the normal hind foot valgus alignment as depicted on the right hand side of the screen. This is usually 5 to 10 degrees. When the patient goes onto tiptoes, this hind foot valgus turns into a hind foot varus in a patient with a flexible hind foot. And finally, assess the plantar foot, including for any plantar ecchymoses, which is pathognomonic of a Liz Frank injury. Here in our patient with bilateral pes planus, notice that the 2.5 digits are visible on the lateral aspect of the foot, indicating likely tibialis posterior insufficiency, the most common cause of adult acquired flat foot deformity. If a patient has pes planus, it is important to ask them to perform a single heel raise test, which is another way to assess tibialis posterior tendon insufficiency. Patients will have difficulty performing a single heel raise. Patients with a normal tendon can complete around eight to 10 repetitions. If, however, a patient has pes cavus, it is important to assess if the deformity is forefoot or hind foot, driven with the Coleman block test. A book or block is placed under the foot and rotating it to allow the big toe to hang off the side, we can see that deformity corrects and an arch is maintained. This would imply that the cavus is driven by a forefoot deformity and that the hind foot is flexible. Moving on to the gait assessment. As part of formal gait assessment, footwear inspection forms an integral part. Ask the patient if the shoes are new or old and if they wear orthotics. Assess the bottom of the shoes for distribution of wear and any abnormal wear patterns. Assess the orthotics for wear pattern and assess the medial arch. Finish by bending the orthotic to determine if it is a flexible orthotic. The gait assessment includes rate and rhythm as well as each phase of the gait cycle. Heel strike, stance, push off and swing phases are, as depicted here, reference to the left lower limb walking from the top right of the screen to the left. Please see our knee examination video for a full run through. In the frontal view, comment on foot thigh progression angle and any coronal plane deformity. 
On the side on view, is there normal heel strike and toe off? Assess the step height. For example, a high stepping gait would indicate a common perineal nerve or sciatic nerve injury. Additionally, ask your patient to walk on tiptoes and then heels. If unable to do so, this may be secondary to the effect of arthritis or muscle weakness in the calves or anterior compartment. Common gait abnormalities can be recalled by the mnemonic straws. S for short leg, where you step down on the short leg, then vault up on the long leg to compensate and the patient's head bobs up and down. T for Trendelenburg, abnormal pelvic tilt resulting in the patient's head swaying from side to side. R for rigid, characterized by hip hiking and circumduction of the leg. A for antalgic, with painful shortened starts face, imagine walking with a stone in your shoe. W for weak, location or joint involvement dictates the weak gait pattern. Weak hip, such as in Trendelenburg. Polio patients often present with back locking of the knee due to weakness of the quadriceps. Foot drop, due to common perineal nerve palsy, resulting in a high stepping gait so they can clear the ground. S is for supratentorial, including spastic, ataxic or equinus gait. Now to the feel component. Assess for tenderness, swellings and defects with one digit and always pay attention to the patient's face. Be systematic with your landmarks and first assess warmth and swelling. This part of the examination is best performed with the examiner and patient both seated. Start with the lateral malleolus, subtalar joint. Lateral tarsal bones, cuboid, fifth metatarsal base, metatarsophalangeal joints, squeeze the MTPJ to assess for Morton's neuroma, medial tarsal bones, deltoid ligament, and the medial malleolus. Palpate tibialis anterior with the foot dorsiflexed, medial malleolus and deltoid ligaments, tibialis posterior, lateral ligament complex, and the Achilles tendon. Now to move. It's important to assess active before passive range of mo movement as it allows the examiner to gauge pain levels and anticipate end range for subsequent passive assessment, as well as saving time if normal. It is also important when describing range of movement to actually quantify the degrees of motion achieved. It is not clinically useful to report it as only reduced or limited. When assessing passive range of motion, feel for crepitus. With hind foot movements, it is important to isolate subtalar movements from ankle movements. For ankle dorsiflexion, cup the heel with one hand and grasp the forefoot with the other hand, bringing toes to the shin. Then plantar flex the forefoot to quantify the degree of plantar flexion. Now switch hands to assess subtalar joint inversion and eversion. Motion is assessed with the ankle in plantar grade at 90 degrees by cupping the heel with the forefoot resting on the forearm. Invert and evert the heel. At this point, perform the Taylor tilt test assessing maximal inversion, which should be less than 15 degrees in a patient with stable antralateral ligament structures. Assess midfoot supination and pronation by cupping the heel with one hand with ankle at 90 degrees and the other rotating the mid and forefoot externally for supination, then internally for pronation, then a deduction and a b duction. 
assess hypermobility at the first MTPJ, including the great hallux dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, abduction, commenting on if the deformity is correctable or not, along with pain and extremes of movement. Now to special tests. It should be noted, special tests should always be done with discretion. For example, the Achilles squeeze test should only be performed with the correct history of trauma and a noticeable tenderness on posterior palpation, with inability to move the ankle. Assessing the anterior draw test. With the patient supine, flex the knee up to around 90 degrees and the ankle in 10 degrees plantar flexion. Stabilize the midfoot and hind foot with one hand, and with the other, grasp the distal tibia and translate forwards and backwards with greater than three millimeters asymmetry being abnormal. This would suggest ATFL instability. Now to perform the Simmons-Thompson test. Ask the patient to lie on their stomach, prone, with feet hanging off the edge. Squeeze each calf in turn and the foot should plantar flex. Absence of plantar flexion of the foot is a positive test suggestive of Achilles tendon rupture. Remember to assess the foot resting position. A full thickness Achilles tendon injury will have the foot abnormally dorsiflex compared to the contralateral side. Now for the silver scold test. With the patient seated, leg hanging, place one hand on the knee and the other hand and forearm cradling the ankle in maximal dorsiflexion. Gradually extend the knee, noticing the difference in dorsiflexion of the ankle at 90 degrees flexion compared to full extension. No difference suggests Achilles tightness, while increased dorsiflexion with the knee flexed suggests gastrocnemius tightness. Finally assess for Mulder's sign, a test for Morton's neuroma. Grasp the forefoot at the level of the first to fifth metatarsophalangeal joint. Pinch the third and fourth web space then compress the forefoot. A palpable, sometimes audible click can be produced, termed Mulder's click. Finally, remember to assess the patient's neurovascular status. This is particularly important in this examination as neuropathies are frequently seen in the foot and ankle and will influence their management pathway. First, assess dorsalis pedis as shown. Next, palpate the posterior tibial artery. Follow this with assessing the deep perineal nerve for sensation. Next, the medial plantar nerve sensation. This is followed by the sural nerve and the superficial perineal nerve, which can be tested over the proximal dorsum of the foot and the distal leg. Next, assess the saphenous nerve. Now the motor assessment. Femoral nerve innervates quadriceps and is responsible for knee extension. The deep perineal nerve innervates tibialis anterior and EHL, which is responsible for dorsiflexion of the ankle and the great hallux. The tibial nerve innervates tibialis posterior and FHL, which is responsible for plantar flexion of the ankle and great hallux. The superficial perineal nerve innervates perineus brevis and longus and is responsible for eversion of the ankle. Thank you all for your attention. Please remember, when it comes to orthopaedic examinations, remember look, feel, move and test.